No, I'll start just a minute. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Victoria Namle, and share with me is Mr. Peter Noho from Ghana. And in today's discussion, we're going to have an, an analysis of the African mining codes. I will just share with you. So we're, we're going to have a discussion on African Africa's mining codes, uh, specifically looking at the issue of how we can balance their interests. So this is a book chapter in our upcoming African mining book. And uh, the authors of the book include uh, Mr. Dramani Bukhari, Dr. Ishmael Aka, and Mr. Peter Noho. But however, uh, Germany and, uh, and Ish Ishmael will not be able to make it today, but Peter will take us through a discussion on Africa's mining codes. But before we start, I'd like him to briefly introduce himself. Uh, hi to everyone. I am Peter Nuhu from Ghana. Uh, I hold an MSc from the Center for Energy Policy, Mine Minerals, Ways of Law and Policy. And CEPMLP of U University of Dundee, uh, completed with energy economics specialization in 2012, and then returned to Ghana. Before then, I had my BA in economics from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, uh, and then a brief stint with the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning in Ghana. After coming, I went into private consultancy, working for AKK Risk Management Consultant, and then I set up my own uh, company called Ultimate Savannah Solutions Limited. After that, I have also had stints and currently having a stint with uh, the Parliament of Ghana as a research researcher. Intermittently, I do consultancy. And so I've worked with uh, Aka, uh, Dr. Ishmael, Aka then with Dramani who has been with me for God knows how long we've been friends from the university first degree, second degree, and we've worked together, stayed together. And so that's about me. All right, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So we shall start off our discussion on Africa's mining codes. Could you please give us a brief background about this topic and also the key findings or key issues you tackled in your book chapter? All right, so uh, you, we, will, we all understand that the characteristics of natural resources uh, i.e. the fact that they are depletable, that the extraction, their extraction impacts the environment, and that they require a lot of capital from the onset. And this capital is mostly private, competitive capital, uh, capital that has to be uh, at end by uh, countries. Uh, there are interests usually that has to be uh, satisfied both on the side of the state and on the side of the private investor or resource company that is coming in with its capital. On the state side, there are interests that has to do with the overall physical take, how much does the state earn? Then on the private, uh, there's also the timing of these receipts. There's uh, the issue of uh, environmental impact and how physical regimes in, coexist with other laws in the, in the, in the state. Then on the private or investor side, there are issues of uh, the risk and return balance. We have issues of uh, the overall competitiveness, issues of stability and predictability of the physical regime. And so what happens generally is that the physical policy of a nation seeks to balance these interests. Uh, whether it is a contractual regime or it is a, a concessional regime, they, idea is to balance this in, uh, interest using a number of uh, instruments. Uh, you will see that across there are mostly two types of uh, instruments that are generally used. One that includes imposts or taxes where the state seeks to extract, use these taxes to extract as much revenue as they can from the resource. And then in order to remain competitive, they must also give in some incentives to attract the private capital. And so you will see that this physical policy is mostly a measure of both imposts and uh, uh, incentives. So what we sought to do in this chapter is to assess a number of fiscal regimes across Africa. And so we selected about five countries, uh, Botswana, Ghana, South Africa, Tanzania, and Zambia. 
and to assess these countries, one on how competitive their fiscal regimes are. And so we use the fiscal analysis for research industries, for resource industries model developed by IMF to first of all, study what the overall average effective tax rate is in a country. Once we did that, we're able to tell that, okay, if you go into country A or B, this is what you should expect in terms of uh, effective tax. Then we also assess how much of the total revenue generated from resources come to the state. So we did that. Then we gauged each of uh, the state's physical regime against the very interest that we've already enumerated earlier and to see how they satisfy some of these interests. After that, so that is the first leg of our, our work to assess the balance, how the fiscal regime balances the private and then the state's interest. Once we did that, we went further to look at what local content regulations, how they have been used to maximize uh, the state's own benefits from resources. So principally, that is what we did on, the, on our topic. Uh, I can go into the, some, some of the findings we have, if that is fine. Okay, so what we uh, saw is that if you come across the five countries that we studied, the five countries we studied, Botswana, you will realize that in terms of imposts, they, uh, they have about the second lowest of the five countries that we, 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 we assessed. You see that their uh, co uh, uh, corporate income taxes are about 22% for residents and 30% for non-residents. They have a royalty rate that uh, runs between 10, uh, 3 and 10% and is charged on gross value. They have a withholding tax of 7.5% uh, to 15%, a VAT of 12%. But they try to, to balance this with a, a number of uh, incentives, including the capital allowance of 100% in year, the year that the cost is incurred. We have unlimited loss carrying forward. We have, so total, you have the ineffective interest rate of about 55%. And then the government's share of or physical take of about 37%. You just oppose this with Ghana that has and a corporate income tax of 35%, uh, a royalty of 5% on gross turnover, a withholding tax, 7.5 uh, to 15%, uh, capital allowance, 20% straight line. And you see that the effective tax rate in Ghana is 57% with a government share of 38%. So government Ghana of the five countries is about the fourth highest that we have. You come to South Africa, which is which uh, presents the lowest imposts and then uh, effective tax rate. You will see that total effective tax rate in South Africa is about fifty three percent, with a government share of thirty six percent. That is lower than all the other countries that we've assessed. Uh, Tanzania is about the highest, with a, a inter company uh, corporate inter interest rate of thirty percent, royalty running between three and six percent but effective tax rate of about 60% and a government share of 41%, that makes them the highest. And so we looked at this to tell you that if you are going into this country, this is what you should expect and this is what you should expect. So those are some of the findings uh, we have. We can go step by step later as the questions come to look at how they try to balance the various interests, like I said earlier. All right, uh, thank you very much, Peter. So I'll, I'll ask my first question, because uh, when you look at Ghana, it has had several mining codes and several mining laws, and we, we categorize the mining codes into three generations. We have the first generation of mining codes, we have the second generation of mining codes, and also the third generation of mining codes. But in analyzing these codes, um, I'm basically referring on from my research, my, from my mining book, we noticed that the fiscal regime has been changing considerably because in the first generation of mining course, that's when the countries were still under the influence of colonialism. And also in most cases, these countries never benefited in terms of taxes from the mining sector. And it's one of the reasons as to why um, most of the countries with mineral resources 
they've been like historically they've been the poorest so my question is because obviously things have changed with the new laws with the new mining codes as an economist um what is your opinion with respect to the fiscal regime in the mining sector and how it is being reflected in the mining codes uh do you think the share the countries are getting or the host governments are getting from the minerals and mineral development do you think the share right now is fair enough for us to uh, see or even uh witness economic development driven from the mining sector and uh, as you're answering this obviously you can uh, draw examples from the different countries you've analyzed and also um from your expertise and as an economist to highlight some of the key issues that african governments should consider with respect to the fiscal regime in the mining sector all right so if i get you first we are looking at fairness yes. uh, of of the regimes uh-huh. uh like you indicated we have had a history of changes and uh, any time we've had to change it has been as a result of the fact that this uh, general citizenry of a country have risen up to demand that there are changes to the physical regime because that's not satisfy the state's interest and uh, what we've had is uh, that come into the country or uh, uh, companies that come into the country and because hello my internet seems to be back at it again uh i i lost you a bit i hope my your internet was bad so i decided to remove my video to see if it will be better <laughs> but i'm here oh, okay. yes yes i can right. tell you right now it's okay. good yeah. okay so what i'm saying is uh historically we've had those changes because any time with uh any time there is change that change has been as a result of the fact that the citizenry of uh, each of these countries like you use Ghana for example have reason up to demand that there are changes to these laws because they felt that the regimes are not fairly treating or yielding to the interest of the state and so you have uh, these demands and this is as a result of the fact that the share of mining resource resource revenues to the total gdp or budget of these countries is huge and so when there's any lack of development it is traced straight to this uh, mining mining regimes because the people believe that why do we have these resources and we are not able to attain the development especially if they just oppose what is happening in their country with other countries mostly they develop and even sometimes they, they uh not so the developing countries so if you come to Ghana you have a mining enclave around Obuasi and mostly you will have the residents just opposing that with uh Cape Town in South Africa where they think that the mines mining companies have been able to develop those areas far more than we they have in Ghana and so the citizenry agitation usually causes this but although previously you will say that the effect uh, the, there was not too much fairness recently we have to say that like i've just indicated we are having state stake as much as 41% of the total share of revenues that are coming into the sector that aside we have to also be mindful of the fact that the initial outlay that comes in from the private companies are so huge and that over time the pricing of uh, mineral resources is very volatile and so you should not expect that we will get a certain chunk especially if you prove your historical historical uh physical regimes your uh, agreements you entered to were entered to previously when you didn't have so much muscle in terms of bargaining uh that said i think that right now we are not doing so badly except to add that we are still there are still countries in africa in which you have a lot of stabilization clauses especially freezing uh, the freezing types 
that seems to take over the sovereignty of uh, these nations, uh, just opposing that with uh, the sanctity of contract and all that. But aside that, so that is the main thing that we have to look at. The first thing is uh, how does, how do we use stabilization clauses? Do we even move away from stabilization to adaptation clauses where we can simply say that, okay, let's do economic equilibrium where the, the, the changes in the physical regime or in laws or legislative or market changes affect the economics of the agreement so much, then we can renegotiate and instead of having a blanket freeze using a stabilization clause that frees everything and say that the state does not have a say in what happens going forward until the expiration of contrast, sometimes running 25, 50 years, that is not fairness. And those are some of the things that the state may have to consider. The state can look at uh, the polluter pay uh, uh, regimes where we are saying that environmental degradations that are occasioned by mining must be uh, resolved by mining companies. Otherwise, you leave the place poorer than you came to meet it. So this will be my response to your question, please. All right, uh, thank you very much. You've raised a very important issue with respect to some of the provisions that have been included in these contracts a very long time. And also I, I think um, I wrote recently about stabilization clauses, freezing clauses. And in my opinion is we have been so, uh, we have been so tied to the past in that we think that everything we have to do, we have to follow maybe the, the past laws or mining codes and all the provisions that were included in those mining codes, including the freezing clauses. But if I ask my next, next question, I would like to just open up the discussion. I said to people online, I don't know if they, they would like to say something. Let me promote them. I see Emils, is it Emils? Would you like to ask Peter a question? And also I see St. Paulo. Would you, do you have a question for our presenter before I move on to the next questions? Okay, um, St. Paulo or Emius, do you have any questions or remarks before I move on? All right, so I'll move on to the next question. Uh, so Peter, you've raised uh, very important issues with respect to some of these provisions. And I believe in your analysis of the different Af mining codes in Africa, we notice a shift in some of the ways where renegotiating contracts, some of the provisions we're agreeing to, but also we are, we are seeing um, a situation where we're being forced, not forced, but we're still holding on to some of the provisions that were in the 1970s and it is the 21st century. And some of those provisions obviously are the freezing clauses and the negative impacts associated with them. But moving forward, I'd like to tackle on the issue of local content in mining codes. So in your analysis, uh, do you think that the issue of local content is being given extra attention? Cause I'm asking this question because obviously with the mining sector, we have large scale mining where we are seeing many foreign companies coming in and we also have small scale mining or at and small scale miners. And the differences in these two sectors, they are so visible looking at the challenges at some small scale miners face, especially with respect to the use of red material methods. And yet on the other hand, we think lots of mechanization with respect to large scale mining. So I would like your remarks on the aspect of local content. How can African countries ensure that they use the law or even the mining codes and other important instruments to ensure that we localize the mechanization and technology that is associated with large scale mining, whereby we can also see or witness small scale miners employing some of these modern methodologies or technology in their work. Right, so uh, we uh, assess now from our five countries that we assessed, we realized that there are differences with which we approach local content. Uh, specifically, there are laws, the laws are not 
uh, uni, 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 I don't know, united in such a way. They, they have not brought and they are not brought under a one umbrella like we have in Ghana. In Ghana, we have a local content act. So it covers entirely and directs as to what we want to do. If you go to Botswana, for instance, there is nothing specific on uh, like that. We have some one or two laws disjointed here and there that communicates what their local interests should be. And so yeah, one, the first thing to do is to see how we can unite all our existing laws that speak on local content and probably come up with a, a more comprehensive document for each of these countries or these states to as to how to go about it. But uh, going, uh, going into it, you will realize that what we have spe uh, specifically done most of times is to use local content for education. For instance, if you come to Ghana, we have laws that specifically talk about how um, uh, comprehensive. Yes, there are. We have a, a few clauses that will talk about uh, purchasing local. Some of those things because the biggest trust of local be. Said that if we have to employ uh, a company to come well, hello, Peter. I keep losing you. I keep losing you. I think it's the network. I keep losing you. Wow. Yeah. Is it fine or not? Is it better now? Yeah, it's better now. It's okay. All right. So should be technology transfer how it's okay. It's okay this is serious eh? what's happening uh, my internet usually is not as bad right now it's clear it's clear. Okay, so what I'm saying is the main trust of local content should be technology transfer, how companies utilize that come in with technical expertise, imbibe this technical expertise to the locals, so that if, for instance, we need to hire welders, and we don't even have the local expertise to do that, uh, the company should not be allowed to go completely and hire a foreign entity that does all this welding and moves back. It should be said that there must be a collaboration between a local entity and then a foreign entity with the expertise so that by the time the procurement is finished and the service is rendered, the local con uh, company would have learned the rudiments of the particular job we are talking about. And so we should look, look at local content in that sense instead of just thinking about how many jobs a mining company is able to create or employ. Okay, so the company is employing a thousand people. We want that 10% or 20% of that should be local. That we should go beyond that. And that is what we've, we've, we've realized with, with most of our, because youth unemployment is a huge issue in Africa, we've paid attention specifically to that. But we can go beyond that and look at how my transfer of technology is done in relation to the industry. This is what will guide the small scale miners and then bring them on board to the level where we want. Because if you come to countries like Ghana, our small scale mining is more of a distraction than uh, mining. Hello, hello, hello. The impact of their works. So it is better to get these doors. Uh, I had lost you. Huh? Again. <laughs> all right. So I don't know. Can I can I try rectifying this before we continue? Uh, all right. All right. All right. But the thing is, right now you are clear. Like I think when. 
when I serve lost to you, then the internet gets better. So I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... But I think right now it's fine. Yeah, so what I've just done is to switch to another internet to see. I have about, I have two different, so I've just switched to see if, it's, if this is fine. Okay. I hope this is better now. Yeah, it is. Yes, so we should uh, rather focus on the transferring technology from these big companies to local ones instead of uh, paying all our attention to uh, employment creation. And if you come to Ghana, I don't think we've done badly in this regard. Because if you look at, in terms of value in, in the industry, if you look at procurements between 2017 and 2018, we did an increment of about 287% in terms of what procurement is done locally. And so if we can get all the other African countries going that far, uh, we, we should do well. And that is just because we had changed the basket of uh, services and uh, uh, goods that we, we, we classify to be uh, procured locally. And so we can look at using local content in this regard instead of just for employment creation purposes. Thank you very much for that. So we are nearing the end of our webinar. Do you have the um, conclude, co concluding remarks and key issues or um, key considerations for policymakers in the different African countries with respect to mining codes? What are the key things they should consider? What are the key provisions? So this is just our, conclu our conclusion with respect to this topic. All right, so to start with, uh, Whilst we are mindful of uh, physical competitiveness, we must uh, begin to understand that Africa has come a long way in terms of our mining uh, activities. We've uh, mined in this continent for so long. And so we have gained enough muscle in terms of bargaining power to be able to negotiate our contracts better than we previously did. When we started, we didn't have the geological advantages that we have now. Right now, we, have, we are dominant players in the, in, the, in the sector. And so we should be able to negotiate, if not as much as the Western world, the US and the UKs, we should be able to negotiate as much as uh, some of the big developing nations. And so freezing clauses, stabilization clauses should be a thing that we move away gradually and that we shall begin to see that just as happened in America, because if you look at uh, the companies will come with the historical antecedents, indicating that historically your physical regimes have uh, changed, people have, we've had to take over mines and all that. And so they want to protect their investments and all this. But if you look at the, the changes in fiscal regimes that has even happened in the, uh, elsewhere, for instance, if you go to investments in US between the last four years and now with the Trump era coming in, uh, in terms of issues regarding uh, climate change and how uh, entities have been, for, uh, have been allowed to go as far. And now the new regime that has come in and is going to curtail some of those uh, things there will be physical changes and economic impacts on investment. But you will never find a company going to America and telling America that because we've had such major swing, the swings in your physical regimes, we expect that you put stabilization of prison clauses in our, in, in our agreements. That has still happens in Ghana. And we think that we have come a long way to be able to uh, stop some of these things. At best, we put in adaptation clauses that talk about economic equilibrium. When you leave that aside, we shall make sure that uh, polluter pay becomes a, a primary clause in every agreement that we, we, we go into because we should not leave the mining areas in the states where we have in Ghana here, where you take out the economic value of the, mine, the, the, the area and then leave the area so uh, deplorable. So those should be the two main policy issues that we should look at going into the future. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for the contribution, especially with respect to the key clauses that we really have to look into when we're negotiating the mining agreements, the stabilization clauses, issues of environment, because in, in most African countries, they're dealing with issues of mining closure. Most of the mines are abandoned. And you notice that it's the local communities who are suffering after the companies and maybe the government have benefited economically. So moving forward with the economic development, with the climate justice, environmental protection, then we really have to be very careful in the 21st century. We have no, we have no uh, excuses, honestly, because we have the knowledge, we have the expertise, so we should be able to negotiate uh, favorable mining agreements. We should be able to enact our laws in a way that is going to benefit the people, benefit the government, but also taking into consideration the interests of the investors. So this marks the end of our webinar. Would you like to share your contact details? Yes, uh, I, yeah. yes so I am available on the email. Okay, you can just read it out. Okay, so it's Pete, P E T E dot Nuhu, N U H U at gmail.com. Pete, P E T E dot Nuhu, N U H U at gmail.com. All right. Yes. And thank you very much, Peter. I noticed we are not connected on LinkedIn. We have to connect because I've already. Yes, shared yes. Your and, uh, yes. I, 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 will, I, will, I will connect immediately after this. All it's right. surprising though, because I'm connected to you on a number of platforms and okay. it's, it's surprising I haven't uh, seen that. All right, so have a lovely day and thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. And I'm looking forward to receiving your book chapter on this very important issue. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, it, it should come pretty soon. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh,